The federal government versus journalists has raised some new questions on the Hill. For one, in the world of the Internet, blogging and tweeting, are bloggers and tweeters journalists protected by the First Amendment? Let's talk to Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox News senior judicial analyst. You know, it's a great question, especially in light of the uh, James Rosen and mm -hmm. Associated Press uh, experiences. When these statutes were written, they didn't have bloggers. No and tweeters. Or television. So journalists were defined as people who were paid to do research and publish the research, usually cutting edge uh, research, or people who spoke it. So it sure. could be James, it could be you, it could be, could be me. But if uh, Mrs. Ducey is at home doing some research and nobody's paying her, right. and she's seriously looking for the truth, and she's posting it, and she has sources, can she protect those sources? The courts have not yet answered that. In my opinion, she's as much a journalist, I'm not just picking on her because she's your wife and a lovely <laughs> woman, she uh, or someone similarly situated right. is as much a journalist as Rosen and the rest of us. Well, uh, go back a couple of years ago when Matt Drudge was starting this thing, this blog called The Drudge Report. Whoever heard of this? Exactly. Uh, let the, okay, he's getting paid by whom? Uh, nobody. He's just doing it and presumably by ad Look, clicks and stuff like that. First Amendment, he's a blogger. He's the, protected, isn't he? The purpose of the First Amendment is to protect the pursuit of truth and the expression of opinion. And it doesn't matter if you get paid to pursue the truth or express an opinion or you're just doing it on your own. That's the argument that I would make. Sure. We were talking uh, in the break about if the government officials who order, you know, investigations or raids, as we were just talking about. Gibson guitar? Exactly. If, if those people were to be held uh, liable, what if would they happen? were to be held personally right. liable, if Eric Holder were personally liable for what he did, to James Rosen. That stuff would stop overnight. But the government has written statutes that make it very difficult to sue the government and insulate its employees from personal liability. Somehow I think Mrs. Holder would stop her <laughs> husband from doing this stuff because they wouldn't have a house left. Uh huh. Mrs. Ducey and Mrs. Holder just heard their names on television. <laughs> All right, uh, Judge Napolitano, thank you very much. Sure. Interesting stuff. Well, a number of media outlets are now asking whether Congress needs to take a new look at a federal raid on Gibson guitar nearly two years ago. In August of 2011, agents dressed in SWAT gear swarmed the company's facilities in Tennessee, accusing Gibson of illegally using foreign wood in their guitars. Now, in light of the IRS scandal, some are asking if perhaps that incident was another example of punishing a top Republican donor. Here to explain, Judge Andrew Napolitano, who's our Fox News senior judicial analyst and this was a crazy situation when they went down you, you would have thought that gibson was in the business of manufacturing you know plutonium yeah and I, not guitars well, with, well, with the way this raid went down well i was stunned when i heard about the raid first of all it was on three different facilities these guys and, and women came dressed in swat gear with what we would call machine guns pointed at people and they took dozens and dozens of employees out into the parking lot. They then seized what they said was the illegal wood. They effectively shut down the business, a beloved business to many Americans, but a privately held, perfectly lawful business. They shut it down uh, for about a month. Uh, Gibson's legal bills are about two and a half million dollars. They haven't even gotten back the wood that was seized from them. Now this wood, if, if it was improperly imported, that is a civil wrong. It's not a criminal wrong. You can't go to jail for it's making a mistake. It's not the same as manufacturing plutonium. Correct. It's not the same as manufacturing methamphetamine. Stated differently, there was absolutely zero basis to achieve what they wanted to achieve with guns drawn and people dressed in military uniforms. Okay. This is way, way overboard. And so now why are we talking about this two years later? Because we found out that this administration has a penchant for seeking vengeance against those who want to speak out against it, and the owner of Gibson did so verbally by endorsing Republican candidates and financially by endorsing them as well. Something that might not have occurred to those of us, like you and me, who watched this stuff at the time it happened. Now we see more and more of a pattern, but nothing as potentially violent as what Gibson did. State law prohibits this kind of uh, use of, of, of force. Federal law requires that that which was seized be compensated for, and the Department of Justice regulations do not permit this military-style raid on a company unlikely to resist, not involved in criminal activity, which made a simple mistake and imported the wrong kind of wood. In fact, the mistake, it turns out, was actually the exporter in India, not Gibson, the importer here in the United so States. So who was behind the raid? Who was the one? Was it, was it, was it local cops? Was it the feds? Was it the well, DOJ? We, we know it was the feds, but we don't know who in the DOJ, which is why I was very happy to hear in your 
introduction to this segment that Congress may be looking into this because Congress can summon Eric Holder if he's going to if he's going to be revealing this time mm -hmm. and say did you know about it did you authorize it who was in charge of it who decided that instead of knocking on the door saying you're using the wrong wood and we're going to fine you and if you don't like the fine you can challenge it's us a phone call and, it's right, a phone and, call and instead sent what looked like an army to invade this place because now they're, they're the reports are that um Gibson, okay, so their, their chief executive is a big Republican contributor. Right. But at the same time, this company, C.F. Martin and Company, uh, was using the same East Indian rosewood. And to make their guitars. Their, their CEO uh, was a big, long time, is Democratic supporter. With the tens of thousands of contributions to Democratic candidates, he did not get raided. Look, the, the raid was unjustifiable. The use of force at the raid was criminal. But the government is required to treat similarly situated people in a similar way. If C.W. Martin is let alone or gets a letter in the mail saying, we think you imported the wrong wood, they have to do the same thing with Gibson. They can't use force on Gibson because they're Republicans and a letter in the mail on C.W. Martin because they're Democrats. The whole purpose of the Constitution is to prohibit the government from using its monopoly on force against its opponents and leaving its, its allies alone. I'm sure that the, the DOJ would say that that wasn't their motivation, that this was not a political targeting. This was, you know, an, an instance in enforcing the law as is, and they're not allowed to import this rosewood. But, you know, the problem for them now is that Eric Holder also said that he would never, you know, prosecute a journalist. He didn't prosecute jo James Rosen, but he told a federal judge that he was a criminal co-conspirator in order to get a search warrant he against him and so on. He told a federal judge that he was a criminal co-conspirator, knowing that he wasn't and knowing that they would never uh, prosecute him. I would really like to know who in the Justice Department made the decision to use a military-style raid with machine guns rather than a letter in the mail in order to address an issue that is not even a federal or state crime? Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll find out now. I hope we, I hope we do, because Americans won't, won't tolerate this kind of force in their faces. Mm -hmm. it, well, it, it's been tolerated. I mean, there was some brushback, but now we have a different perspective to look at uh, the Gibson situation through us. We we'll see. And they wound up settling and, and agreeing to pay a $300,000 penalty, Gibson did, in the wake of this. I mean, what would you do if you had the, and, and where if does you had that, the DOJ where does that... raiding you? Right. Well, well, now there's another lawsuit about whether the feds are going to pay Gibson for what they did to them. All right. Got to go. Judge, thank you. Pleasure. New questions this hour, Jenna, following yesterday's announcement that the House Judiciary Committee is now investigating whether e Attorney General Eric Holder lied to Congress while testifying under oath about his department's pursuit of journalists' personal records. During a hearing on the matter earlier this month, Mr. Holder told lawmakers that he was never involved with or had any knowledge of what he called the, quote, potential prosecution of the press for the disclosure of material. But only days later, it emerged that it was Mr. Holder himself who signed off on the very search warrant identifying our own correspondent, James Rosen, as part of a criminal conspiracy to leak classified information. Let's talk about it with Judge Andrew Napolitano, a Fox News senior judicial analyst. Judge, welcome. John, good morning. There are four investigations underway. Do you think Eric Holder is going to survive them? I don't think he'll survive them to the extent that he'll uh, remain in office as attorney general, but I also don't think he's going to be prosecuted for perjury, which of course, as you know, is not unprecedented. Uh, in interestingly, James Rosen wrote a book, uh, a biography of John Mitchell, one of Mr. Holder's predecessors, who was prosecuted for perjury, lying before the Congress, and was convicted and went to federal prison for it. But in this case, I think he'll be politically undermined as members of the president's own party decide, we don't want to have anything to do with this. Let's Whether he lied, told the truth, or misled, he clearly gave the impression he knew nothing about this. It's an awful thing that they did, calling James a criminal, when, when there was no basis for it whatsoever in order to justify getting a search warrant of his private emails. The Democrats will wash their hands of it, and the president's hand will be forced. Well, let's take a look at what uh, Eric Holder said. This is on May 15th. Two weeks ago today, uh, here's what he told Congress. Listen. With regard to the potential prosecution of the press for the disclosure of material, that is not something that um, I've ever been involved in. That is not something I've ever been involved with, and yet we know that he personally signed off on, on the search warrant. Uh, for James Rosen's personal records uh, going back to 2009. It's, it's really strange that he would make a statement like that. I don't know if it was under oath, 
but it doesn't matter because he has the same legal obligation to tell the truth to a congressional committee whether they administered the oath to him or not, and the penalty for failure to do so is the same. It's really weird that the attorney general would do that and then his own Department of Justice, two weeks later, leak to NBC News. Well, he really did know about it. In fact, he personally signed off on it. And then over the three-day Memorial Day long weekend, the Justice Department that he runs would confirm, yes, Attorney General Holder did know about it, and uh, he takes his job uh, seriously. Now there's the, the inevitable question, well, were you telling the truth? How is it that you told this congressional committee that you knew, knew nothing about it? Did you forget? In which case, your competence is to be questioned. Did you lie or mislead? In which case, you're not qualified to be the Attorney General. Always good to have your take on this, Judge. I'm sure we're going to have you on many, many more times. I don't think this is going to be over tomorrow, John. All right. Judge Andrew Napolitano, thank you. Pleasure. To front and center at the White House, an attorney general whose support just might be slipping at the White House to Ed Henry, who is there. Ed, what's the latest? What's interesting is a lot of pressure on the attorney general because of uh, the James Rosen uh, search warrant in terms of emails and phone records, etc. Uh, and whether or not he told Congress the truth about that uh, back on May 15th, before the public knew that in fact all of this had happened, the attorney general had gotten a question from a Republican congressman about, uh, you know, in general, the possible prosecution of reporters. Uh, and at that time, Attorney General Holder testified on the Hill that, in fact, he had never heard of anything like that, that he had never been involved in anything like that. This is raising questions about whether the Attorney General told Congress the truth, which is why Jay Carney got a series of questions about it today. Take a listen. Was he not telling the truth on that point? He was involved in it. He involved in what? He, he signed off on the search warrant. Maybe he was a unindicted is that, Are you not involved after but, signing but off on again, the search warrant? Again, I would refer you to the Justice Department. But you guys, are, words, you guys are, are conflating, you know, uh, uh, the subpoena with prosecution. And I think that it is... Im Question? Again, I would, I would just point you to what the Attorney General said. But so it is a technical accuracy you're I, holding on to. I'm not. I'm saying that based on what I've seen in published reports and what the Attorney General said, I don't see the conflict, but I would refer you to the Justice Department. Now, what basically Jay Carney is saying is that since this was hypothetical, uh, basically in his eyes, because uh, the Attorney General never intended to actually prosecute James Rosen, he was telling the truth on Capitol Hill before all of this was revealed. In fact, when you look at the Attorney General's comments, uh, he was specifically saying he had never heard of any possibility like that even though he knew that this had been going on for a few years behind the scenes. That's why he's facing pressure on that specific question. Those questions are not going to go away because there were Republicans who were calling for Attorney General Holder to go. There have also now been some Democratic pundits who have been doing it as well. We haven't heard Democratic lawmakers do that. If they step up the pressure, it'll put even more heat on the White House now. Ed Henry at the White House, thank you very much. In the meantime, the White House today saying the Attorney General did not commit perjury, despite being more than just a little hands-on in this whole James Rosen mess. The judge on whether the AG is in deep doo-doo or not. Judge Zapolitano, what do you think? Well, there's two legal problems that the Attorney General has. One is, did he actually lie when testifying, whether under oath or not? He, he's going to try and equivocate his words and say, I was, as you just heard Jay Carney uh, tell Ed uh, Henry. And by the way, Ed Henry sounded like a, a serious but angry cross-examiner. He did, he, he asked, did. He asked some great questions and Jay Carney dodged them. But they're actually going to hang their, their uh, hats on the hook of the preface to his statement in which he said, with respect to prosecuting, I don't know anything about it. However, the other legal issue that the Attorney General has is, did he mislead the Congress? See, he must not only be truthful, he cannot mislead. And he clearly left the unambiguous impression to a neutral listener that he had nothing to do with the James Rosen affair, when in fact he authorized and approved it himself. And it was a torturous episode for him and the whole nine years. Correct. Misleading the Congress can also get him in legal hot water and he could be indicted for it. Will he be indicted? I don't think so. Because who would have to sign off on the indictment? He would. Or he would have to appoint a special prosecutor and investigate himself. That leads us to the other argument that Ed Henry was talking about. Is he losing support at the White House? He will when more and more Democrats are afraid to be tarred with his brush, who will want nothing to do with him, and who will say, look, whether he lied or not, He's no our, one has any, your pound of flesh. Right. No one has any faith in this guy as attorney yeah. general. So, Mr. President, I know you play basketball with him. I know you wine and dine with him. I know he's your good buddy. 
He's got to go. Uh, is it possible he misled the president? In other words, the president, uh, detached, uh, the, he seems to be from these scandals, uh, might not know and might be genuinely uh, in shock with well, what he's hearing. You know, Neil, that's a very good question. We don't know what he said to the president. But if he truly did sign off on the Rosen affair and the application they made in order to get James Rosen's personal email uh, accounts was absolutely erroneous, shameless, and should never have been accepted by a, a federal judge, if he signed off on that and did not tell the president, I could hear the president say to him, why did you get me into this mess? I have enough problems with Fox News the as it is. Right, but that, you read my, my next question. It, it, the obligation would be to tell the president that, but maybe is there such a separation with the attorney general that you can't brief the president on sensitive matters like this? And that is yet another excuse why his chief counsel didn't inform the president about this whole IRS stuff and everything, because you, you want that detachment. Well, then, if the, if the president doesn't want to know what's going on, when he has, when his Justice Department has in his hands the emails of a Fox News reporter and the telephone logs from Fox News personnel, we don't know who because they right. blacked out the last four digits, but we saw the first six, and, and that's New York, and that's Fox New York, and that's Fox DC. If the president doesn't want to know that, then the president is out to lunch, and he ought to know what's going on. So ignorance, Nobody ignorance, should ignorance isn't a defense. Here. Absolutely not. Okay, Judge, thank you very, very much. The IRS under scrutiny, of course, for targeting conservative groups, but the trouble doesn't end there. Last week, armed federal Homeland Security agents showed up at rallies across the country as Tea Partiers gathered to protest the IRS. Did they have a right to be there, or is this just another example of bully tactics from the government? Joining me now to analyze Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good morning to you, Judge. Good morning, Gretchen. So these armed security guards from Homeland Security were not, they were not there to say, hi, we're from the Department of Homeland Security, right? Well, we don't know why they were there. We know they were out of uniform and they were armed and they were there sort of monitoring a demonstration. You know, the American people were sold the idea of Homeland Security, which President Bush, to his credit, was actually against, felt we didn't need another, uh, another police department. Mm -hmm. We were sold the idea of Homeland Security that they would protect the borders and they would protect um, the airports, also arguably the borders. Now they've become another police department. Think about it, if there's a rally on 6th Avenue, right outside the building where we are now. The police will be there, in, in just sort of around the area, to make sure nobody gets hurt. The large concentration of people in a small area. You don't expect a federal police department there, and you don't expect the federal police to be out of uniform so you don't know who they are, and you don't expect the federal police to sort of be breathing down people's necks when they're expressing opinions against the federal government. That's what happens. And the Supreme Court has said many, many times, Gretchen, the First Amendment needs breathing room, meaning you shouldn't be afraid to express your opinion that you're going to offend the person you're disagreeing with, especially if that person is the president or federal police that work for him. Okay, so people are going to feel chilled by this when they find this out today. That well, yeah, I mean, that's the technical, they, they, that's they, the technical they word, they, chilled. They are going to feel chilled by it. So my question to you is, is it legal? Well, th th there is no statute that prohibits it. There is no cause of action against it, meaning you, you can't really sue Janet Napolitano and say, get your goons out of here. You basically have to put no relation. I'm laughing because off air we refer to her as I'm cousin Janet's goons. I'm laughing because you said goons. Okay, continue. Uh, but but you, you, the, the only way to resolve this is to put political pressure on the president to remind him his job is to protect our freedoms. And when the police are breathing down people's necks because they express political opinions against the government, that inhibits our freedoms. But here's what I am so surprised at, and maybe I shouldn't be, is that in light of all these recent scandals, coming out of Washington. Why? You would think that the Department of Homeland Security and this administration would be extra careful to not overstep any bounds Agreed. Right Sometimes the government has a tin ear as to what uh, offends people. 
Sometimes the government just wants to sort of uh, don't challenge uh, our authority. But the government needs to recognize its first job is to protect our freedoms. And when it inhibits us from exercising them, it's not doing its job. I do want to mention that Homeland Security also tracked Occupy Wall Street peaceful activist demonstrations as well. Why do we need a federal police department to track anybody when they're lawfully expressing their political opinion in a public place? That's not a job for the police. It's not a job for the feds. Judge Andrew Napolitano, we got to leave it there. I think I'll hear from Cousin Janet later today. <laughs> oh, oh, she, who knows? They might have your phone number <laughs> under surveillance. You never know, yeah. Judge. All right, have a great weekend. Pleasure. The court martial proceeding began today for the Army private responsible for the biggest leak of classified information in American history. Bradley Manning reportedly again waived his right to a jury inside a courtroom at Fort Meade in Maryland, clearing the way for a military judge to decide the verdict. Bradley Manning insists he spent he sent more than 700,000 secret military and, di and diplomatic documents to the whistleblowing site w WikiLeaks. In fact, he's already pleaded guilty to a lesser charge or charges that could put him behind bars for up to 20 years. But prosecutors want to try Bradley Manning for the much more serious crime of indirectly aiding the enemy. Upon conviction, that could mean a life sentence. Many people have called the 25-year-old native of Oklahoma a traitor since his arrest three years ago. But Manning himself says he wanted to expose what he calls the U.S. military's disregard for human life in Iraq and Afghanistan. And for that, he has his supporters, some of whom showed up outside Fort Meade this weekend to rally on his behalf. Joining us now, Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. We did learn a lot from what he did. Whether it was appropriate within the law is another matter. But we learned a lot. Well, we learned the gravity of the uh, of the materials that he submitted, which were highly classified. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very unusual case for a couple of reasons. One, he's waived his right to a jury, almost unheard of in a case where the government wants to lock you up for the rest of your life. Would you trust that decision to just one person, the judge, especially a, a, a military judge, a person who has the same boss that he does? Secondly, he's already pleaded guilty without an arrangement with the government. He just walked in the courtroom and said, there are 15 charges against me. I plead guilty to this, 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 and this, without any agreement from getting something in return from the government. Ordinarily, when you plead guilty to a group of charges, the government agrees to a, a maximum range for the penalty, and it agrees to dismiss other charges. That's not the case here. So the guilty pleas can be used as evidence against him in the remaining principal charge, which is espionage. Espionage is intentionally aiding the government, aiding the enemy. The government wants to put him away for the rest of his life, even though he's already exposed to 25 years in jail on this espionage charge. That, that's a tall hill to climb on one hand, and it's a precedent-setting thing on another, isn't it? It's a tall hill to climb, correct, Shep, because the government must prove not that he accidentally did this, not that he, he hoped that the enemy would get this, but he, that he did this for the purpose of aiding the enemy and harming the United States. Now, he's probably going to take the stand in his own defense, and if he does, he's going to say, I'm a whistleblower, I'm a patriot, I did not want to harm the United States, I wanted to help the United States by exposing what the government was doing wrong so that the people could see. If the judge accepts that argument, then he cannot be found guilty of this espionage charge because the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he intended to harm the United States by helping enemies. And to that extent, having a judge hear this instead of a jury is what's so precedent setting. Mm -hmm. No one has been convicted of espionage in American history before by other than a jury. Mm -hmm. Begins today, a few weeks on this, probably. I would think so, but a lot shorter because the judge is there. I can tell you from having tried cases without juries, it takes about one-tenth the time that it would try if a jury were there. So. Yeah, the, the, judge, the judge won't let the nonsense go when, when he's the one hearing it. She, yeah. right. Or she in this case. Right, got it. Excuse me. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell her. <laughs> hey, don't tell Megan. Just don't tell Megan. Thank you. You got it. There was a fundamental failure by IRS management to prevent this inconsistent treatment and ensure that it was halted once management became aware. These failures have undermined the public's trust in the IRS's ability to administer the tax laws in a fair and impartial manner, and they must be corrected. The testimony before a congressional subcommittee of the new acting director of the IRS, a man whose agency faces about 25 lawsuits at the moment.
Our chief Ju uh, senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, was with us. If, if I'm the lawyer for the uh, 25 plaintiffs in those 25 lawsuits, that's my opening comment. I don't have to say it myself. I just have to play the same tape to a jury that you just played. I I'm happy that he's being honest, but it's damning in terms of admitting what happened and proving the plaintiff's cases against the IRS. Bigger picture, and in the interest of all Americans, <clears throat> is making sure that groups which apply for tax-exempt status deserve tax-exempt status under the rules that have been established. If you don't deserve it, you shouldn't get it. That's basic. A.B. Stoddard, associate director of the, and columnist for the Hill newspaper in Washington, that, that, that's part of what this is all about. An agency in charge of something has never been in charge of something before. Right, and that's what Mr. George, the IG, was talking about, that in formalizing the process for this, yes, there have been delays, yes, they've asked for unnecessary information, but there's going to have to be a formal process for this to make sure that groups re requesting tax exempt status truly deserve it and that their activities under a 501c3 are actually social welfare and they're not primarily political activity, which is not um, allowed by the law. A lot of work there, Judge Napolitano. Yes, absolutely a lot of work. Remember, the essence of the case against the IRS is that they did not treat applicants with the same level of scrutiny. They applied stricter scrutiny for the, to the documents of conservatives than they did of non-conservatives. If they're going to apply that strict scrutiny to everybody, it's a tremendous amount of work and a tremendous cost, but it will be more fair. And that's what this hearing and, and the investigations, which will no doubt follow, are all about. Good morning to you. 46 minutes after the hour now here on Fox and Friends. I'm Anna Coyman and a major Supreme Court ruling could infringe on a person's privacy rights. As of now, criminal suspects can be subject to a DNA test after arrest, but before proven guilty. So what does all of this mean for your constitutional rights? Let's ask Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good morning to you. Good morning, Anna. Nice to be with you. Great to be with you as well. And this Supreme Court ruling coming down yesterday, pretty narrow, five to four. Uh, and they say that this does not go against the Fourth Amendment against illegal uh, searches and seizures. But you say it's, it's not good. Well, well I, I think the, the dissent, which is, which is made up of the court's most conservative member, arguably, Justice Scalia, and its three most liberal members, Justices Sotomayor and Kagan, appointed by President Obama, and Justice Ginsburg, appointed by uh, President Clinton, make the stronger case. And their case is that the Fourth Amendment was intended to protect innocent people from unreasonable searches and seizures by the government. And that protection requires probable cause. You go to a judge and you demonstrate evidence of why you need this, that it's evidence of a crime, and if the judge agrees, the judge signs a search warrant. But, but some this equate opinion, this even to fingerprinting. Well, th this opinion allows the police to take your DNA just when you've been arrested, not after you've, yeah, not after you've been convicted. The majority equated this with fingerprinting, with the process for arrest. Uh -huh. But when they do that, they fail to appreciate the significance of DNA. When the police have your DNA, it is a gateway to a, a, a storehouse of information about you, your health, your life, your genetic background, what you do to take care of yourself, things that are not the government's business. That's the reason right. we have the Fourth Amendment, so the government only gets what it needs to prosecute you, and it doesn't get things that are none of its business. Right, and you're, you're mentioning really what the privacy advocates are saying, that, you know, what if, uh, say, insurance companies get a hold of this information somehow, and then they, they uh, you know, are, are going against somebody, discriminating them uh, because of some pre-existing condition. The government is very bad about keeping private information private. Right. And once this information is available to police or any bureaucrats in the government, the opportunity for abuse is expansive. Now, lest people think that uh, they're going to get swabbed uh, for jaywalking, these swabs, they, they put a Q-tip on the inside of your mouth to collect the, uh, to collect the DNA. They don't break the it's skin. It's not surgical. It's not surgical. But these swabs are only utilized for crimes of violence. They're only utilized in states where this is authorized. Not all states authorize this. All states authorize the collection of DNA after conviction. That's right. a different story. You've been proven guilty. But some states, Maryland, and now the other states that do this as well, which permit it before conviction at the time of arrest, can do yep. it. And some people say it's just like, a, you know, a, a making us more of a police state, adding to tasers for talking back to cops and strip searches uh, on roadside stops. You Thank know, you so you much, know who Judge. thinks that? The dissenters. Yep. And of yep. course, I agree with them. There you go. Questions are being raised about Susan Rice's promotion to national security advisor now, especially after she appeared on five Sunday talk shows and bungled the Benghazi talking points. But does this new post mean she gets to skip out then on testifying? 
intriguing question this morning for Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. And before I get to that, some little birdie told me it's your birthday today. Oh, did you have to say Happy that? Happy birthday, <laughs> Judge! <laughs> You're so kind, but at my age, you just as soon forget these things. Yeah, I know the feeling. <laughs> anyway, let's Thank get back you. to uh, let's get back to Susan Rice. Uh, kill me's this... behind this, I know. No, it, <laughs> it wasn't kill me. It was somebody else you love. Hey, uh, so let's get back to Susan Rice. Does this appointment to the NSA chief take her out from having to ever testify about Benghazi and what she knew? Well, no. It it takes her out from having to testify about conversations she has with the president in the White House going forward. Those would be conversations classically protected by executive privilege. The president is talking about a national security issue with his national security advisor. She cannot be compelled to testify about that. But they do not insulate her from having to testify about what happened in the past. So she could still be summoned before the House or Summit, put under oath, and compelled to say, who gave you those talking points? How is it that you gave this false story to Chris Wallace on Fox News Sunday and four other talk shows? Why hasn't she been called? Well, that's a good question. It's probably a, a political question. Why the House of Representatives, which, in which the Republicans have subpoena power and about which they've been, in my view, quite justly and properly animated over this, uh, have not called her. Look, she is either a dope or a dupe. It appears in this instance that she was a dupe, that she did not know the truth, hmm. that someone told her what to say and she said it anyway. Yeah, but that... Do we want a person yeah. like that as the president's chief national security advisor who talks to him every day? You took the question right out of my mouth because if she was <laughs> duped on this and she was called an expert on foreign policy and national security yesterday by the people supporting her, so if she's such an expert, would she not have known that she was being duped? You know, only she will know the answer to that. There is no question but that she's an expert on international affairs and national security. Her adult life has been devoted to it. But is her loyalty to the president and his political cause going to blind her independent judgment, mm -hmm. as it apparently did when she went on those five talk shows and substantially and materially right. misrepresented to the nation what happened? Okay, now what about Tom Donilon? Because he is the gentleman who's leaving the NSA post. Can he be brought back to testify about Benghazi? I would think that the president will invoke executive privilege because, again, when Tom Donlan spoke to the president as the national security advisor, that's classically protected speech that cannot be inquired about. President, a national security advisor, national security is the subject matter and nobody else is there. Wow, very interesting. All right, Judge, have a fantastic day. Lots of cake and ice cream when you come back. I'll, I'll be up there in a few hours. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. First, though, let's take this new matter to the judge, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Harry Reid says, we should just calm down, Judge. This has been going on a long time. They've been able to stop some sort of terrorism, this, that, or the other thing. So just don't worry about it. Just relax, everybody. See, the, the laws are really screwy here, Shep. The laws allow the executive branch, the president and his agents, to tell select members of Congress when they are doing things like that, but prohibits those members of Congress from telling the other members of Congress or the American people. Just because Harry Reid knew about this for seven years and it's been going on for seven years does not mean that it is constitutionally permissible. This is a fishing expedition on the grandest scale we've ever seen in American history. They are looking for a select group of people, and in order to find that select group of people, the Constitution says, present some evidence against them to a judge and you'll get a search warrant for their phones. Rather than doing that, they got a search warrant for 113 million phones. That we know of. That we know of. And they said to us, you know, don't worry. It's fine. Trust us. We're not listening to the calls. We're just keeping records of them. Who would trust them after this? The Constitution doesn't trust them. As Ka Catherine Harris just pointed out, they lied under oath, this administration, when they were asked under oath, are you collecting information about American citizens? And Admiral Clapper, who's the head of all this, said, no, we're not. Listen to Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham, listen. I'm a Verizon uh, uh, customer. I don't mind uh, Verizon turning over records to the government if the government's going to make sure that they try to match up a known terrorist uh, phone with, with somebody in the United States. But that's not, that's not what they're doing. No, that's they're looking into all of our phones. All we know about is Verizon. That's the hundred and something million. 
There are other phone companies out there. Their records haven't leaked. Who are we to think they didn't do this with all of them? Of course we're to think that. The whole purpose of the Fourth Amendment is to prevent the government from doing just this. It's to prevent it from interfering with the privacy rights of innocent people, a lot of innocent people, in order to find a few that may be planning something wrong. Nobody wants the wrong thing to happen. But the idea that we would sacrifice liberty in order to obtain safety is a canard. This is just a shortcut to make it easier for America's spies to spying on Americans. Shep, they spied on the West Wing. They spied on the Pentagon. They spied on the Supreme Court. They spied on the CIA. This is spies spying on spies. This is the most extraordinarily broad search warrant ever issued in the history of the federal courts of the United States. That we know of. That we know of. Under this logic, the government could send people to all of our homes, put them in a bed next to us, have them watch everything. Under this logic, they can come, they can do anything. Under Senator Graham's logic, he'll be happy with it as long as they catch a few bad guys. Yeah, well, we'll, be, we'll see how happy he is when he runs the next traffic light and the government agent sitting next to him goes, nope, you ran the traffic light, here we go. Time to drone you. Would it be easier for the government if the police could kick down any door they wanted sure. and arrest any bad guy? Of course it would. But who would want to live in a society like that? The slippery slope is covered in grease. It is. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. We're not letting this go. Don't, not for a moment. Not letting this go. 18 minutes before the hour on Studio B, a family spokeswoman says the 10 year old girl in Philadelphia who's in desperate need of a lung transplant is getting worse. We're now learning that the parents of an 11 year old boy in the same predicament at the same hospital have filed a lawsuit seeking to get him on the adult transplant waiting list as well. This after a judge yesterday made an exception for the girl, ordering Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius to allow that girl on the list after her parents filed a lawsuit. Woo! <laughs> the girl celebrated in her hospital bed in Philly after hearing the news. She has cystic fibrosis, a disease that makes breathing very difficult. Her parents say she will die if she doesn't get a transplant and soon, and that she needs to be on an adult list because there's, because there's so few child donors. Secretary Sebelius on Tuesday told a House panel she would not intervene in the case, saying medical experts should determine the rules. Another court hearing for the girl is set for next week. Meantime, she has at least nine days to find an adult donor, and there's no guarantee she'll find a match. Trace Gallagher with the details on this. So, Trace, Kathleen Sebelius is now not going to fight this, right? Yeah, and that's the good news, Shep. She's not going to uh, appeal the decision, and she's even told the Oregon Network to comply with it, sending a letter that reads in part here, I'm quoting, OPTN, which is the Oregon Network, created a second candidate record for Miss Murnahan with a birth date that makes the system treat her as a 12-year-old. I also understand, says Sibelius, that her original record remains active, so she retains her priority for pediatric donors, which means that she is now on both lists, and as happy as Sarah was when she got the news yesterday, Yesterday afternoon. Now, as you said, Chef, she's taken a turn for the worse. Her fever spiked. Her heart rate is way up, and they're hoping not to have to intubate her, which, of course, is to put a breathing tube down her throat. The family just told us there is no updates. The bottom line here is right now she's in pretty bad shape. Chef, do we know where she sits on this list of those in need? Not exactly, but they won't because they won't tell us, but we know that she's very near or at the top of the list, and here's why. Potential lung transplant patients all get what they call a, an LAS, which is a lung allocation score of 0 to 100. The higher the score, the worse off the patient. On the waiting list, you see there are 1,682 patients, but only 139 have a score that's greater than 50, which they consider severe. And look at this. When Sarah, on Monday, her score was 66, which is extremely extraordinarily high and today it has shot up to 78 so that 78 number puts her in grave danger Shep but it also puts her very near the top of the donor list so it's it's very much bittersweet for the family Shep. Trace Gallagher thanks the girls case is raising a debate over who should be responsible for deciding these types of medical decisions Dr. Arthur Kaplan is the director of the Division of Medical Ethics at New York University Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano joins us again as well. Dr. Kaplan, it sounds to me like what they're doing is saying the, the medicine has evolved to a point where this can work, so to not have her on the adult list would be in essence discrimination against a child, age discrimination. I think that's what they're saying, Chip, but it's a little different because children 
who get adult lungs don't do as well as adults who get adult lungs, and that's sort of getting lost here. It's not that surgeons sat around and said, let's put kids at the back of the bus. What they said was, because the fit is poor, big person going into small chest, the lungs are very fragile, they get damaged, it's difficult. What you have to do usually is take a piece of the adult lung and put it in, that raises the chance for complications. So, kids generally don't do as well when they get an adult lung, that's why the list was the way it was. It was trying to maximize the chance of saving a life. Putting Sarah on the list is great, moving her up, somebody else just moved off. Judge, what, what, are, what are the legal standings here? Well, you know, the, the problem that Dr. Kaplan raises is one that was not raised in the courtroom and, and was not before the judge yesterday uh, because Mrs. Sebelius did not make it in, in resistance to the application. So the parents go into court and say, our baby is about to die and Mrs. Sebelius has the discretion to make an exception for her case. The case in the Bronx is not before this judge. The information Dr. Kaplan just related is not elevated to the judge, so the judge says, you know what, I think you should make the exception because it'll, it'll save her life. Now comes another case yeah. where the baby almost as, uh, as ill, per per perhaps even more so, we don't know yet. So. In the Bronx, it'll be before a, a different federal judge. Will that federal judge rule in the same way? This is a new area for judges, but the job of judges is to do the right thing in the case before them, not in the grand scheme of things. They rely on guidance from people like Dr. Kaplan, who should have been in the courtroom yesterday, but wasn't called by, uh, by uh, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. And one of the difficulties, Shep, is when you start going to court and you say people saying, well, it's arbitrary or capricious, I want a shot too, you're going to get a long line of people potentially showing up saying, I don't like this system, I'm at the bottom of the list, put me up at the top for whatever reason they may come up with. You're starting to jeopardize the entire distribution system that we have for all organs. In other words, I could say, hey, they've got me lower down on the list because I'm 80. I want to be at the top of the list. I Find me a federal judge and let's stick me up there. We've tried to distribute organs in this country according to who's most likely to live, who's most likely to benefit from getting one. When you start to turn it into an appeals process or a PR contest about who can get everybody's attention, that may not be the best use of scarce organs. That's why it's surprising that the uh, government is not appealing that decision yesterday mm -hmm. because it's very unusual for a federal judge to substitute his or her judgment for the judgment of either the experts that HHS has employed or the secretary of HHS uh, herself. So when the federal judge did it yesterday and she said, I'm not going to appeal, she's basically accepting the fact that this judge took discretion away from her and exercised it the way he thought it should have been exercised. Judges don't usually do that. Judge, doctor, <clears throat> thank you both. My pleasure. This is Geraldo Rivera reporting that the embattled president, meeting this weekend with his Chinese counterpart, and already under fire for Benghazi, for an out of control IRS, and for an aggressive campaign investigating leaks to the media, is now confronting a brand new dilemma. Does he order another criminal investigation of two more gigantic leaks? One that the government is monitoring Google, Facebook, Apple, and other internet companies and users overseas, and monitoring the phone calls of more than 100 million Verizon users here in the States. Nobody is listening to your telephone calls. That's not what this program's about. As was indicated, uh, what the intelligence community is doing is looking at phone numbers and durations of calls. They are not looking at people's names, and they're not looking at content. The president stresses that these previously undisclosed programs are authorized by Congress and fall under the supervision of a secret court. And unlike his other scandals, on these latest controversies at least, the president has received some bipartisan support. Homegrown terrorism is one of my biggest concerns. It's happening in our own backyard, and I'm glad the NSA is trying to find out what terrorists are up to overseas and inside the country. We don't have anything to worry about. I'm glad the activity is going on, but it is limited to tracking people who are suspected to be terrorists and who they may be talking to. But other legislators worry that given how the IRS, for example, has perverted its mission and run roughshod over people's rights, that these latest revelations are further proof of an out-of-control federal government. It calls for a full and open congressional hearing. What are you doing? 
why are you doing it, how much has been done, so that we can have a full and complete accounting. Now someone over in one of the intelligence agencies thinking, well McCain's given away all our secrets. Well, shouldn't Americans know if the government is carrying out a practice that could be an invasion of privacy? Judge Andrew Napolitano, uh, is this a violation, welcome, is this a violation of the Fourth Amendment? It's a, it's a profound violation of the Fourth Amendment. Interestingly, Geraldo, and by the way, it's always a pleasure to be with you, no matter where we are or what the time of day or night. Same here. It is not a violation of the statute that authorizes it in the Patriot Act, but that statute is a violation of the, uh, of the Fourth Amendment, because the Fourth Amendment was intended to prevent just this fishing expeditions. The Fourth Amendment was intended to make sure if the government is going after somebody, whether by force or by stealth, there was evidence to justify it. In this case, the government went to a federal judge at the secret FISA court where it doesn't have to present any probable cause of crime and just said, give us an open-ended warrant. There has never been a search warrant as broad in scope and as poorly grounded and as intrusive to as many people in American history as this one is. Why would a federal judge, knowing exactly what you and I know about the Constitution and the limits of the statute, why would a judge allow the federal government such unbridled authority to snoop on so many of us? In the FISA court, where of course no one appears for the person whose calls are going to be scrutinized. It's just a government uh, prosecutor and a couple of FBI agents. The standard of probable cause of crime mandated by the Fourth Amendment in the Constitution is lessened. The standard is we're conducting an investigation of terrorism. We don't know what's out there, but we need to know what is. That violates the value judgment of the Fourth Amendment. The value judgment of the Fourth Amendment is we have a right to be left alone unless there's evidence, probable cause of crime. The, the statute which lets them go to this federal judge just ignores the Fourth Amendment. And there's nobody to challenge this because unless you know that they're listening to your calls and unless they want to use your calls as evidence against you and it's in front of a judge, you're never in a position to challenge it and hence stop them. Now to the nuts and bolts of the search itself. First of all, you now have over 100 million suspects, it would seem. Yes. Now they claim that they're not monitoring the substance of the conversation, but rather they are checking numbers against known terrorist numbers, that that's the, if they're looking to see if there's a match Here, between telephone Here's numbers. what the warrant authorizes them to, to seize, the information they're allowed to collect the name and address of the caller, the name and address of everybody on the phone call, the telephone number of the caller and everybody on the phone call, and how long they spoke. They have asked us to trust them, trust them that they are not going to listen to the calls themselves. Do they have the equipment with which to listen to the calls? Yes. Do you trust them? Do the people watching us now trust them? Does the Constitution trust them? I suggest to you the answer is no to all three of those questions. Well, I trusted them a lot more until I found out that the IRS was targeting organizations based on their political ideology. What if they don't like my political ideology? Well, we know they don't like my political ideology. We know this thing, because it's Fox issued, is, is Verizon. So this is caught up in that sweep. This type of dragnet, we don't know what's out there, but somewhere in the 113 million subscribers is somebody we're looking for, is exactly what the Fourth Amendment was intended to stop. I would submit to you, Judge, that of the 113 million people that they are searching, you and I might be high on the list of probable suspects. We, well, but we are not a danger to society. We may be an oh, irritant. Maybe a we may be an irritant to them. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> an irritant for sure. Now, is this part of the, another symptom of flailing around? Is this like the press probe? Is this like the IRS's intrusive behavior? What is this administration doing, or is this symptomatic of something? I think it's symptomatic of big government. And quite frankly, this start, started in the Bush administration, not of this magnitude. This is a government, and, and it, 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 it seems to be endemic of all government today that thinks it can write any law and regulate any behavior and intrude upon any constitutional guarantee so long as it can get away with it. Is it easier for spies to listen to phone calls 
without a specific search warrant? Would it be safer in the streets if the police could arrest bad guys on a whim? The answer I suggest to you is yes, but who wants to live in a society like that? I'm not sure which bothers me worse, the broadness of this effort under the Patriot Act or whatever it is that they were looking for, if they really know something that ominous as to justify a sweep of this magnitude. What could be that ominous? A conspiracy amongst the 100 million of the 113 million? Come on, this is laziness and this is avariciousness on the part of spies. This is an unchecked appetite to intrude into the privacy of honest, decent, hardworking Americans on a scale the likes of which we've never seen and I hope we never see again. Judge Andrew Napolitano, on that note. Thanks, partner. Pleasure, Geraldo. But right now on Fox News Alert, brand new details on the government snooping scandal. We're learning more this hour about the man who says he leaked government secrets about the surveillance of millions of Americans. As the British newspaper that broke the story reveals that source. National correspondent Steve Santani is live right now in Washington for us. Hi, Steve. Hi, Patty. And the 29-year-old American who reportedly leaked the classified information, Edward Snowden, says it's important for Americans to understand the kind of secret surveillance that's being carried out in their name. Listen. Because even if you're not doing anything wrong, you're being watched and recorded. And the, the storage capability of these systems increases every year consistently by orders of magnitude. Uh, to where it's getting to the point you don't have to have done anything wrong. You simply have to eventually fall under suspicion. Snowden is now holed up in a Hong Kong hotel after allowing his name to be released. He's a former CIA analyst who was working for a defense contractor in the Hawaii office of the National Security Agency when he revealed classified information to the Guardian of London and its journalists Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras. Here's more. I'm just another guy who sits there day to day in the office, watches what happening, what's happening, and goes, this is something that's not our place to decide. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. The revelation has sparked a spirited debate about secret surveillance. The White House and many lawmakers are defending the program as an effective way to prevent terrorist attacks. But others are pushing to reopen the congressional debate over the post-9-11 Patriot Act, which made this kind of surveillance possible in the first place. I think that's private information. I think if the government's gathering that, the American people ought to know it. We ought to have a discussion about it. And frankly, I think we ought to reopen the Patriot Act and put some limits on the amount of data that the uh, National Security Administration is collecting. The NSA is calling on the Justice Department to investigate possible criminal charges against the leaker who the Guardian newspaper now reveals to be Edward Snowden. Patty Ann? All right, Steve Santani live for us. Thank you. You bet. For more on this, let's bring in Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano, who joins us now on the telephone. Judge, uh, thanks very much. Look, sure. this, this guy Snowden um, leaked classified information, which, as I understand the law, is a crime. Will he be prosecuted? Oh, I would think he will be prosecuted. Um, and he, he, he claims to be in Hong Kong, which, of course, today is under the uh, dominion of uh, the Chinese government. Uh, interesting little uh, tidbit, the President of the United States just spent the weekend with the President of China. One wondered right. if he was aware of this, but we have an extradition treaty with them, with the Chinese. Um, if the Chinese want him to be prosecuted, he'll be in Los Angeles tomorrow. If they don't want him to be prosecuted, they'll find some political way for him not to get here. But quite frankly, Greg, he sounds as though he almost welcomes the prosecution. In his mind, he's, right. done, he's done nothing wrong and nothing uh, prosecutable. Yeah, and some of his explanations make sense. Some of them are, are kind of like on the edge of a little bit odd. Um, but let me ask you this, because some are already calling him a whistleblower. If you look at the 1989 Congressional Act, the Whistleblower Act, it gives protection to whistleblowers who work for the federal government when they report agency misconduct. I'm not sure this qualifies as agency misconduct, Judge. I mean, it appears as though all of these programs were signed off on by a FISA judge. When a judge says it's legal, it's legal, isn't it? Well, yes and no. As you know, Counselor, something can be both legal and unconstitutional at the same time. And this is where we get into that gray area where values 
value judgments, uh, the Constitution and different ways of interpreting the Constitution may collide uh, with the law. As the law is worded, we're speaking of the Patriot Act and other enabling legislation, right. the um, uh, surveillance was lawful. But as the Fourth Amendment is worded, the surveillance was unconstitutional. So a court's going to have to decide sure. that. I, I don't know, quite frankly, Greg, if a court will even let him argue to a jury that he was a whistleblower and what he did was correct. If he does, then a jury's going to decide. If he, if he doesn't, yeah. then a judge is going to decide. So a higher court would have to review the FISA judge's decision to determine whether he misapplied the law, uh, the FISA law, or whether the FISA law itself is so expansive that it violates uh, the Constitution. But, Judge, that could take years, right? Absolutely. And, and we don't know if this guy is going to be free in the years it will take to resolve this uh, or incarcerated because we don't know what path the government's going to take. We do know, right. Greg, that the Obama administration, look at the, uh, the case involving our friend and colleague James Rosen, in which the information that came out seemed like something that everybody already knew. Right. Uh, the Obama administration has been extremely aggressive, far more aggressive than any administration in the uh, post-World War II era, about prosecuting leakers, whether they characterize themselves as whistleblowers uh, or not. So right. I, my guess is they will pursue him and pursue him aggressively, and eventually this will enter that gray area where value judgments and the Constitution can sometimes collide with uh, Congress's reaction to 9-11. Well, one thing's for sure, the leakies, rather the recipients of the leak, the Guardian newspaper and the Washington Post, uh, those reporters are arguably no longer in jeopardy, given what Eric Holder has vowed. That's correct. Uh, That's to, correct. Yeah, to Congress. Glenn, Glenn Greenwald is the James Rosen of this case. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Judge Andrew Napolitano, as always, sir, great to talk to you. Thank you. Pleasure.